Hello, everyone. So I'm Renata Havanelli. I work for Head Hat, and we also have Saken. Hey, folks. Uh, I'm an uh, intern on the core OS team. And uh, we can just hop right in. <laughs> OK, you are here today to talk about how we'll build Fedora core OS. So let's get started. So today, you're going to talk a little bit about the history of Fedora core OS. What is Fedora Core S? Some difference between Hat Hat Core S and Fedora Core S. Uh, how um, you have multiple streams available in your releases and why you should learn how you build Fedora Core S. Our build process as the components of the configs, our Core S assembly, how you do overrides and add new packs to it, and a little bit about our testings and how you deliver the OS as the demos, a couple of challenges for you and how to get involved with the community. So, uh, Fedora Core S basically came from the merging of two communities, the Core S Container Linux and the Project Atom Host. It basically incorporates the philosophy the, from the Chrome Core S Container Linux for the automatic updates, the provisioning stack, the immutable infra and the cloud expertise. And for the project Atomic Host, it incorporates the Fedora Foundation. As it says, based the OS and its structures, such as packets and kernels, and also the updated stack and Selenix enhancing security. But what is Fedora Core OS? Um, it's usually say that Fedora Core OS is an automatic updating minimum operation system for running containerized workloads, security, and at scale. And it's currently available on multiple platforms with more coming soon. Here, I'm going to talk a little bit some difference that most of people usually ask for us between Fedora Core S and Hat Hat Core S. And you can see you have basically two major differences. And for Fedora Core S, it's an um, OpenShift component. It's not an OS that you can use as a standalone. It's a uh, must be used with OpenShift itself. And the second bigger difference is the way it updates itself and the configuration as well. So as it is part of an OpenShift cluster, all the configurations in updated are controlled by the cluster operator. And for the Fedora class, you can use it as a standalone operating system. So, and it also provides you automatic updates itself in a reliable way that we will see soon how that happens. And it can also be part of an OKD cluster, but it's not required to, you can use as a standalone operating system. And both we work with the RPM S3 technology as well the provision of the ignition. So, we are able to provide those three streams for the Fedora Core S, and they will launch the um, releases every two weeks. And for them, we have those three, and, and we will start with next. So it's basically where the development happens, and all uh, it's basically focused as well on experimental features and major Fedora releases. For example, when do you move from Fedora 35 to Fedora 30? Uh, six, uh, it will have the first and max, and then after two weeks, it will be promoting for testing. And so we will have a um, couple of a couple of weeks to test and validate if everything is okay. And after that, um, you also will be able to have time to fix issues, and then it will be promoted to stable. And with this time, we will make sure that once we reach stable it should be a reliable operation system because we will have a couple of times to test and validate everything that's go between all those three springs. And here's a couple of artifacts that you are able to provide as well in all those three streams. And you also provide three different platforms. So we have three streams and three different platforms with, with all those artifacts you have for example, GCP, uh, Azure, um, AWS, uh, everything basically for the cloud providers, as you can also have that for bare matter and all other cloud legible things. 
So I will now pass over to Saka. So thank you, Renata, for that introduction. So um, as we transition to talking about how FCOS is built, let's take a brief look at the, the why. So why learn how to build FCOS? Um, first reason, which a lot of people are probably thinking of, is uh, building FCOS yourself. Uh, you can swap in the kernel that you need or add a new package to the base image, for example. Um, and just a heads up, we'll be doing demos on these later. Um, and then the second reason is uh, you could also try building um, an FCOS-like or FCOS-derived uh, OS. And uh, when I say FCOS-like, I'm specifically talking about Ignition plus um, RPM OS tree based systems. Um, Ignition RPM OS tree being important parts of uh, Fedora Core OS. And uh, lastly, you can learn about the components that make up FCOS. And uh, by that, I don't mean the Ignition and RPM OS tree uh, side of things, rather the uh, parts of the build schema. So what goes into the uh, Fedora Core OS config. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, I think, did we skip a slide? The design? Oh, yeah, we skipped that one. OK, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about our, our, our build tooling. Um, Core Assembler, or just COSA, as we like to call it on the CoreOS team, it's the uh, bread and butter of our build processes. It's a containerized collection of tools that are used to build FCOS-like systems. Um, I, I use the phrase FCOS like systems here on purpose. Uh, so if you were to create your own like FCOS derived OS, you should be able to take uh, full advantage of Chorus Assembler in your uh, build processes as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, another cool thing about COSA is that uh, it serves both local development use cases and production level build systems. So the tooling itself is very flexible, but since the tool is containerized, it also um, makes it easy to just get it up and running on different systems. And uh, here's just a, a link at the bottom to uh, where you could find the built images. So quay.io slash chorus assembler, chorus assembler, um, relatively easy to remember. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, we've had a look at, well, introduction to COSA. And uh, now we can look at how COSA fits into our build process. So we have this nice diagram here from the uh, Chorus Assembler documentation. Uh, definitely do go check out those docs if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, the Chorus Assembler repo at the bottom left. So that's uh, one of those uh, blue rectangles. Um, so as a simplification, we can think of this repo as a build script and uh, a Docker file. So we use uh, Quay.io to create regular container builds. Um, so we have, them we have them available whenever we need them. Uh, and uh, so now that we've, let's say, pulled uh, a container image from Quay.io, and using that image, we've set up a COSA container, um, what's next? Well, so if we go back to that simplification from before, um, we have the build script ready. So what we need now is the build configuration. And that's, uh, that's exactly what Fedora CoreOS config is. It's the uh, build configuration. It uh, tells COSA what RPMs should be present in the build configuration. It, uh, and uh, system D units that need to be launched as part of the first boot process, uh, uh, so on. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about the config in the, uh, in the coming slides. But uh, for now, we'll leave it there. And uh, using this config, uh, COSA knows how to uh, set up the base OS. So uh, lastly, we'll look at that uh, purple rectangle on the, the right there, and that's uh, the outputs from our build process. So there's two main outputs um, from our build process, uh, disk images and OS3 commits. So OS3 commits contain all the information about the file system. So we can generate the, uh, the root file system from the OS3 commit. Functionally, the disk images are your typical uh, images that you would use to provision your systems. But uh, if we take a D 
deeper look uh, the disk images are just wrappers for the OS3 commit. And this means that if you have an OS3 commit, uh, you can generate various disk images from that commit. And this avoids having to redo a lot of the work that's involved with uh, a fresh build. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, in the explanation of the build process, I mentioned Fedora Chorus config. And uh, this was an example of a build schema that COSA accepts. Um, and uh, COSA expects all configs to have certain main components. Uh, the the FCOS config ab also abides by these uh, components. So there are uh, three main components. There's the uh, manifest.yaml file, which uh, tells COSA, and by extension, RPM OS3, since COSA uses RPM OS3, how to uh, generate those OS3 commits. There's the uh, overlay.d directory, which is uh, a directory that uh, contains additional information that we want to add to our OS3 commit. And uh, lastly, we have the image.yaml file, which just contains the, uh, the final configuration of the, the disk images. So if you, if you wanted to make an FCOS derived OS, you would need to declare your your new config with these three components in mind. Um, and that would really allow you to make use of Chorus Assembler uh, as part of your build tooling. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we've, we've looked at an overview of FCOS config, and now we'll talk a little bit about those components in detail. Um, so first up is the, uh, the manifest.yaml file. This is the, the file that's responsible for generating OS3 commits. Uh, we can use it to define a set of packages and the corresponding RPM repositories that come from. Uh, uh, and another cool feature of this file is that uh, it has this post process key, which, uh, which takes in a list of strings that represent inline scripts. Uh, and these scripts are processed by RPM OS3 to make arbitrary changes to the, the root file system. Uh, so there are actually a bunch of other keys as well that you can use to customize your OS3 commit. Uh, and in an RPM OS3 context, this file can be referred to as a, as a tree file. So if you, if you would like to learn more about it and learn about those different features that I uh, didn't mention, then you could check out the RPM OS3 documentation. So I'd specifically look for the, the tree file spec. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then uh, the second component um, was the overlay.d directory, which provides a convenient method of overlaying OS3 commits with additional information. So uh, we have the overlay.d directory, and then there's subdirectories within overlay.d, and then these subdirectories are added to the uh, the paths within the subdirectories are added to the OS3 commit. So uh, in the example on the slide, uh, we have disabled SSH passwords by inserting a file at slash etc slash SSH. I won't say the whole path there, but you get the idea. Uh, and this file has been inserted at the, the same path in the OS3 commit. So uh, one important thing to note here is that this isn't some sort of irreversible change. If we wanted to, we could use our provisioning tool ignition and write a config to turn SSH passwords back on. Uh, however, this sets a default and uh, that's what, so that, that the default means that's, uh, that's what you'd expect to see with an empty ignition config. And uh, that allows us to opinionate our OS and uh, having mechanisms in place to opinionate the OS is important when we're creating such an opinionated OS. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so lastly, we have the image.yaml file. Um, and this is what deals with the other set of uh, build artifacts, which is disk images. Um, we can set disk image configurations through this file. Uh, some of the changes here, like the other files, can be made via ignition, like inserting KARGs. But uh, similar to the other files in the config, this provides a default that allows us to opinionate the OS. 
Uh, next slide, please. So we, we also have some mechanisms in place that help speed up our development cycle. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to quote the, the rationale for overrides straight from our documentation. Um, development speed is closely tied with the uh, edit, compile, and debug cycle. So override speed of development by allowing us to easily test out local changes. Uh, we have two ways of running overrides. You can either pop an RPM into the override slash RPM folder, or you could uh, directly run make install into on a project, uh, and you can install it into the override slash rootfs directory. Uh, so if you find packaging RPMs to be a hassle, then the rootfs option comes in handy. Um, otherwise, I've personally found that RPMs approach is more robust since you don't have to worry about uh, dependencies and that stuff. So there are also uh, lock files like manifest lock .overrides that come in handy. Um, they allow us to uh, use older versions of packages, uh, and uh, there's mechanisms of adding new packages as well, which we'll see about, which we'll see in the uh, the demos. Uh, but I won't go into too much detail about the lock files since uh, Nada will talk about them in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we've almost completed uh, the full lap here. We've we talked about uh, building Fedora Core OS, but what about testing, right? Um, that's that's also important too. So uh, let's take a moment to visit the aspects of the build process, or that aspect of the build process as well. So uh, we have multiple ways that we can write our our tests. There are there are tests that are compiled in Cola, which is our test framework that is included under the umbrella of Core OS Assembler, um, and then there's uh, external tests which are also run by Cola, but the tests are written in Bash and they live alongside the config. So uh, the tests that are written in Go and uh, compiled in Cola support more complex um, operations like interactions between two Fedora Core OS instances. Uh, but the disadvantage there is that uh, those tests are written in Go and uh, they live in Cola and by extension, Core OS Assembler. So this is inconvenient if you're working on like a downstream project and uh, you want to add tests, you would have to go to Core OS Assembler to add a test that's compiled in Cola. Uh, but the, the external tests are simpler and uh, they can be easily written in, in Bash. And they, they also have a more favorable model for uh, adding tests to downstream projects. So if, if you were to make your own custom config for your Fcoast based uh, OS, uh, you can put the test alongside uh, your own config instead of having to worry about adding them to Chorus Assembly. Uh, next slide, please. So in the last slide, I mentioned Cola. Um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about Cola in this slide. So uh, Cola is our, our testing framework that we use to test Fedora Core OS. Uh, like COSA in general, it supports local testing with Kimu, but also has the options for testing on uh, different cloud providers. And uh, it's a very common theme that we tend to see here that both the local hacking tests or both the local hacking use cases are supported alongside the, uh, the production level uh, systems. Uh, so Cola has some nifty features as I wrote here. Uh, uh, and those features are you can uh, write a different configuration config for each test. Uh, we support reboots, so your VM could reboot during a test, and we can pick up from where we left off. Uh, and uh, reruns and timeouts come in handy when we run into infrastructure flakes. Uh, and normally, we run tests. Each test is kind of in its own VM, and this helps us to avoid conflicts. But there are ways of uh, getting multiple tests in one, one VM to save uh, resources. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, it's easy to use. It's uh, included in the course assembler suite of tools, so you don't have to worry about setting up yet another tool. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so 
I've shed some light on the uh, the local building aspect of Fedora Core OS, but uh, we really haven't talked about how do we deliver FPUS and uh, uh, get it out in the hands of users. So for that, I will be passing it on to Hinata. Thanks, uh, Saki. So how I mentioned before, we have the ability to see three different streams and three different architectures for every two weeks and how that's even possible because you need to test everything that you are making available and that's where you came to the investment you do in our CI and as uh, Saka explained you have a, a really powerful tool that's inside Core Assembly that it's called and Colo have uh, give us the ability to launch uh, FCOS instance in the, in the cloud providers that we provide images and you have the ability to go there, test and validate those images as well, run a couple of other tests and make sure that the update is working, the kernel is okay and everything else that we need to validate uh, are able to run in those provides itself and every time you find some issue, you also try to write more tests for that to make sure it will fail or if you catch some bug, it won't work again. And that makes our distribution more able with the time because every time you see a fail or a bug, you will try to add those tests in call and make that uh, reach our upstream. Um, as I told you, yeah, COSA is a really powerful tool that gives us the ability for building everything that you need and also test that locally and have the same exact environment for productions and also if you are testing locally. So if a developer wants to use your own COLA, it should be the same COLA and that we're running to release all those streams. So it's a really powerful tool and it are, it's giving us this also ability to launch tests on the major cloud provider. That's the trick for us to be able to deliver all those three streams every, three, every two weeks for those three architectures. Uh, now I will talk a little bit about lock files. It's kind of unique, the lock files, the way that you, you use. So it has a Jenks job that will kind of create a bump file for us with every single version for the packs that you have. And it's kind of nice because if something changes in Fedora, we have the ability to see the difference between the versions that change. And we have a case that sometimes a pack to you change in the Fedora repository and it will break something. Could be a task, could be a build. And with this difference between the packs that have changed, you are able to track and kind of um, identify that I need to work with, for example, those three packs that have changed, maybe something that occur broke uh, a thing that I'm working. Uh, the lock files also give you the, the ability for overrides, since um, I, I say, so this packs in this version, but for some reason, this version is broken my past, so I could ping an older version until the uh, this package read a, a bug fix in the repository from Fedora. So I can wait for this fix to launch, but it won't affect uh, Fedora because I can go back to the old version and make that still work. So I will add, I won't add any issues for us if I lock that in the old version that's still working. Uh, it just gives us the ability to add packs that won't, uh, are not in the Fedora repository yet, so you can have new packets and wait for them also to reach the Fedora repository. But it gives us the ability to control the packets first that go in the operation system. And that's it's nice because it's, uh, in that way you can avoid issues or even prevent other issues to come. Okay, and um, now I will talk a little bit how we'll have this architecture infrastructure for us to build the three uh, different architectures that we have. So we have basically one instance for Jenkins instead of having three instances for each platform. 
and this distance for Jenks is x86, and it will basically start the build process, and once it's each uh, stable uh, phase that you make sure that the job passed, it will automatically trigger the blue charge jobs for us. And it will create uh, one uh, Jinx job for each platform you support, and it will be farmed out in the, everything will be running Fedora Caress in the back end as well. So the way we'll do, uh, we'll have this Jinx instance that will trigger the first job and the other uh, our platforms will make a call using Podme remote for the server itself. It could be a VAM, a matter, or even a server that is in a cloud provider. And what Podman essentially does, it's in the back end, use SS8. So we'll access the service, run the exactly same process you did for x86, past and go back with the results as the architectures for the instance that call it that. So in this way, you are kind of able to minimize the time that you use because you can also run all those three uh, platforms in, in parallel once the multi-charge jobs are triggered. So for now, we have, instead of x86, you have ARM, uh, S39X, you are hoping to add PPC in the future. Okay. Now, it did kind of a small bug since the build process and fat process take a long time. And as you don't want to waste anybody's time, you try to cut those demos so everyone can at least understand what you have said. And so, let me just pause her. Okay. So, I mean, in a OpenCV cluster, in this case, to make things faster. So, I mean, in a pod. And this pod is, is using Chorus Assembly. So Chorus Assembly right now is based in Fedora 36. So I'm just showing that, but it has all the tooling necessary for building. So I, I create a, a gear here for the demonstration. And to initiate a Chorus Assembly, we first need to, to run COSA in each and pass the repository or branch that you want to work with. In, in this case, I'm going to work with the uh, testing the VAL. So they need to, because in each you will create a tree of directors for us that contains the build and basically the override efforts that will give you the ability to override HUTFS as well as RPMs and the source direct that has basically the checkout for this repository with the configuration that we will be used for, for Dota Coras build. So I will do some fetch here that you essentially download the packets and manifest and everything else that is needed for the build. And after this comment, you can build the asset itself running COSA build. So it will generate the uh, S3 commit for us, and from the S3 commit, you will generate the images. So in this case, uh, we also have a commit image done after all the process. So you can see that creating inside the build directors, and you can have multiple builds uh, in, the, in this build director. So if you run close a build again, it should with some difference in between those files, each will generate for me uh, another build with another version as well. So, and, and you can see everything that's generated. You have the manifest lock that will tell us uh, the version of the packs that is inside that. I also have the community metadata that has also the information about packages and other stuff. And the community and LS3 image. So in, in this case, I will do an override for the kernel packets because most of the, the people have 
maybe in some case they, they want to override current packs and they don't know how. So you can do that in the Fedora request itself via RPM or S3, but you, you need to access that and run that most of the case mm -hmm. if you're kind of hacking a route. But if you want to already have uh, image with the packs that you want, you can override that in the bridge process. So in this case, you are using this version of kernel. Um, and I will put the packets that I need for kernel inside the overrides RPM. Okay, the downside of the, these overrides via RPMs is that uh, dependencies, so if you have a pack that depend on other packs, you need to put all the dependence inside this director. So if you have a pack that you use, the, it's best for you to put that in the manifest uh, overrides because you won't we need to care about the, um, the dependence for that. So you can add these packs in the Fedora Cores base YAML that uh, Sakado you show after. So maybe the best, the best way if you don't once you, oh, it's too hard to handle all dependence. But for hacking around and doing some small chains, it's, let's say, it's, it's a nice way for you to work when you try to be doing our testing. So I will do some fetch and build that again so you can see the result of this override. Okay, and as, as you can see, you also have the difference uh, between that was the grade. So you can see in here, uh, it was the grade from this version from uh, uh, high version to, to the other version. It, that's the thing that is done in, with the ability of lock files that you always tell you the difference between what the previous build and a new build. And you can see each was uh, create a new PG version for you. And in the community metadata, you can also check the package version that is inside this image. And another thing that is cool about uh, our COSA is that it gives you uh, also the ability to start VMs via Kimu. So you don't need to care about the commands and everything else. Uh, that Kimu requires for you to start a VM. So you just need to run the run. Um, in this case, for example, I'm passing a parameter for uh, C that stands for console. So you can see the uh, dev shell console for this case. And I'm ending just a demo here for you to see that I can access this image after it is built. And I don't need to tell the run where the location it is. It's no it by default. So, for example, I'm just double checking here the version that I draw great for kernel and the OS version. Okay, another edge override packet is via manifest block so it also gives you the ability to lock a version that you may want to keep for example for waiting some bug to be fixed in the nearest version and such so i will add here for example a package for kernel exacto so you just need to describe the packs that you want and it usually provides some kind of information why this package is locked or not and for you to understand and such. And you will do the same process as before. You will need to build the, the cause again. Ah, and that's another thing. So you always need to run the cause comments in the main directory because it needs the tree to understand what it's doing.
And I will just open here the commit metadata just to make sure that the version that I add for kernel exacto is the same that I put in the log file. And it's the same, so it works. And another thing as well, because uh, you have the ability to do for testing is passing your ignition. For example, in this example, I will pass my own ignition. So if you wanted to pass some configuration, validate your ignition, you can also do that manually running COSA. And for example, my ignition in this example is very simple. I just try to add some key. So just to show you guys how that will work. So the ignition will inject for me my key. So it will match the same that I passed before in the ignition configuration. Okay, that's it for this demo, and now Saki will show how to add new packets in his demo. Saki, you're mute if you want to say something. Sorry, didn't realize I was muted. Uh, <laughs> right, so I was saying. Uh, so here I've just I've printed a snippet from my uh, bash RC file to uh, show the uh, the COSA wrapper uh, that I'm using here. So this isn't it looks intimidating, but it's, it's something you can find on uh, the core OS assembler documentation. So uh, it's it's a standard copy paste from there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can continue. Oh, I think it's already going right. OK, yeah. I gave myself some time to talk. All right. So. Uh, now we want to initialize our, our build directory. So we're running uh, COSA init here. I'm passing the branch flag to uh, use the testing devel branch, but uh, uh, testing devel branch is like the default branch. Um, I'm just doing it here to, uh, to show off the branch flag. So I don't really need to specify. So this will take a second to, uh, to complete. Um, um, and uh, most of the workflow, if you notice, is the same. Uh, we're just... Uh, changing around a few things. So now that we have our config ready, we're going to go and edit uh, one of the manifest file. So, uh, and we're editing Fedora CoreOS base.yaml here. Uh, in, in Fedora CoreOS config, we have multiple uh, manifest files because they're, they're chained together with include uh, tags. So uh, this just helps in, in our workflow, uh, but uh, in a regular uh, config, you don't have to have multiple. Um, we're going to find the packages uh, key here, and we're just go we're going to go in and add uh, the the calc package. Um, this is just something we decided to use for the sake of the demo. And uh, so now we've added that, we can go ahead and uh, run COSA fetch and COSA build. And uh, Renata did a good job of explaining uh, what those were, so I, I won't go into detail here, but uh, we'll just we're fetching the packages, and then we're using that information to build our uh, new build. So I've sped this up a lot. It shouldn't take too long. It would be like 10 more seconds, I think. OK. Uh, so I've, I've got that going, and uh, uh, now that the build is complete, I'm just going to run COSA run. So unlike Renata here, I haven't passed the the, the hyphen C flag. Uh, so I'm just running sort of the lightweight uh, version of COSA run. And uh, I'm I'm going to bring up uh, a VM from that's running the, the latest build that we just, just made. So otherwise, if you, if you don't want to run the latest build, you can specify which build you want to run through a, uh, a build flag. This should take like 
30 seconds, I think. Okay, so now we're, we're in our VM. And uh, what we'll do is uh, just test out if the calc package is there. So I'll just run a help uh, command. And uh, yeah, so it's there. Um, and that's what we want to see. Things are working as they should. Um, so our, our us adding, we were successful in adding a, a uh, package to the base image. Um, but uh, we really haven't tested if this somehow indirectly broke something else. So what we could do is also go ahead and run our test suite. And uh, doing that locally is as simple as just typing COSA COLA run. And uh, yeah, that, that launches our test suite. So it would automatically pick up the latest build and uh, launch it. Um, uh, we don't have to wait for the, the suite to finish. Uh, I think I accidentally left in a little bit in the, in, at the end of the demo. But um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for the demo. Uh, yeah, I think we can move on. Okay, and we will give you, if someone would like to get involved, uh, I think that the first thing would be try out your Fedora currents and try to join your community. You are always available at the library the chat. If you have some doubt when you try to build Fedora CoS, you can reach us and I think everyone inside the channel will be there to help you or at least point someone or a place that you can find answers. Um, I think now we are going to the questions. Does anybody have questions to us? Let me see the, here the Q&A question. So to, um, there's a question about uh, snippets, and uh, Dusty's addressed the questions, and I was just going to say the same thing. You, you don't have to write an ignition config directly. You could use our transpiler, which I think is a bit more readable, butane. And uh, there are uh, examples that uh, we have on the documentation for that. And uh, Michael's also pointed out that we have good tutorials as well. So. Uh, so FCUS derived operating systems. Uh, so one example that comes to mind is, I'm just pulling it up here, uh, Arcos. And that's the, the config that we have. So um, maybe it's not the ideal example in the sense that it uses a different package set. It uses RHEL. Uh, but uh, it's it's set up in the, the same way that we set up Adora Core OS. So, uh, you can you can check out the uh, the config for that if you would like to have an example of how you might set up your own configuration that extends Fedora Chorus config. Let's see. Any other questions? I can look at this question two different ways. Uh, so, like, I'm not sure exactly what they were wanting but so one is like can i specify an os tree repository to pull from to do a build and the other is can in the image that i'm building bake a reference to a separate os tree repository to then do updates from um and so for the build itself we kind of like the inputs to the build is not an os tree repository it is RPMs plus config, essentially. Um, and then the output is like an OS tree commit that, that we then push to an OS tree repository. So if that's the question, I think the answer is no, because we don't use an OS tree repository as input to this process. Although there's some nuance there because we actually do have an, a local OS tree repository that we use for like previous commit history information. So when a new commit is built, that commit knows about its parent, right? So like there's a history. Uh, as far as baking in your own OS tree repository remote, you can do that. Like you could just do COSA build with your, you know, remote in Etsy OS tree remotes.d, I think 
is the directory. And so like, if you want to build your derivative and point your derivative users to your own OS tree repository, you could do that. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone for joining.